So thank you for inviting me uh, to be in this session. Um, so I'm going to, um, in a sense, not actually move us that far away from London, um, uh, which is sort of the, the point of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm mostly talking about this arch, uh, so I'll give you a very brief overview of the um, events that happens in Trafalgar Square. Uh, I'm going to try not to get too ranty and distracted by that. Um, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the, the placement of the arch when it was in the square, uh, about how or how not uh, that arch has place within it, uh, and then um, thinking about the future, uh, about what might happen uh, if we put something like that back in Palmyra. Um, so the event <laughs> happens uh, last April, uh, no, April before last, uh, in 2016. Um, and uh, was organised by the Institute for Digital Archaeology, who uh, are based in Oxford, but as far as I know, are not strictly affiliated with the university. Um, and uh, um, one of the issues about uh, that event um, was the, the lack of information uh, that went alongside the arch. So there was this big marquee uh, that had these big banners in it, um, that uh, essentially had no information other than advertising on them. That's a slightly separate rant, but it does play into some of the problems to do with place uh, and the arch. Um, so I was there on the, on the sidelines. I was running a, a different project at the time um, uh, called Remembering the Romans in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so this seemed to be um, an opportunity uh, for, for me to do uh, a slightly different thing in this project. So I ran um, something called Postcards of Palmyra. So I asked visitors who came to Trafalgar Square on those three days uh, to uh, share some of their thoughts and ideas. Uh, they could be memories about the site, uh, could be responses to the arch itself. Um, so it was very wide open, there was no, it wasn't like a form or anything specific like that. Uh, we got about 345 postcards in all. Um, uh, and if you want to know a little bit more about that, I'm just going to plug my new article in World Archaeology, go and look under latest articles uh, and you can read about it there. Well, I'm very happy to chat more uh, about it, so that's my lovely team of students who came with me. Um, so in those postcards, lots of different threads came out, um, and one of the threads um, within the postcards um, focuses on place and the placing of that arch, uh, firstly in, in London and in the UK uh, more generally, um, uh, seemed to unsettle uh, people. Uh, so this is just two examples, one wondering uh, why it wasn't in the countries with the highest number of refugees, uh, which also sets up a whole set of issues about why the UK maybe doesn't have as many refugees as, uh, as it might, maybe should. Um, uh, and this one about what are the politics of reproducing in London uh, imagery uh, from elsewhere. It's like awkward use of the word orient, but um, that withstanding, I think that, um, that point um, is an important one. Uh, and then... Uh, something, um, some, this is a pictorial comment uh, about the specifics of putting uh, the arch in Trafalgar Square. Um, I'll come back to the postcard in just a second. Roger Michel, who is the um, uh, director of the IDA, did sort of vaguely comment on why they had chosen Trafalgar Square as a location. Uh, he um, referred to it as a crossroads of humanity, uh, and he said that this was uh, the same as Palmyra. Um, but other than that, very little thought seems to have gone into why would you put this thing uh, in Trafalgar Square? Um, and in this postcard, this is quite an interesting postcard, uh, the arch kind of covers over uh, Nelson's column, it completely uh, overwhelms it. Um, but that is far from, from what it did. Um, and I'll come back to that point. But where you put something, is really important, and um, thanks to um, Gabe Mashensko, he let me pinch this off um, his Twitter uh, feed. Uh, so this is his own uh, little arch uh, that um, uh, Jennifer Wexler made for him from the BM. Uh, it's quite important, I think, where that was placed. Look at some of the, the book titles uh, behind it seem rather apt. Um, 
but I think the IDA maybe didn't think about it quite so much as they might have done. Um, so size and scale uh, was one problem. So unlike the postcard, this is the, the scalar issue um, uh, that was actually taking place uh, at the time. And the arch was tiny. It was completely overwhelmed uh, by the monuments in Trafalgar Square. Uh, and several postcards commented on the, the disappointment uh, of that size. And it wasn't a full scale replica as the the idea sort of led people to believe it was, um, uh, with a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Um, so this was one of the ways in which having this arch there it just diminished the arch. It, it just didn't have much impact in all senses uh, of that word. Um, and also very little thought was given to what it meant to put uh, this object um, next to all of these other uh, monuments. And Trafalgar Square is, is a difficult place. Um, so it's filled with monuments to, to empire and to military might. Um, and that might not seem entirely appropriate uh, for something um, uh, that uh, is only produced because of issues to do with empire uh, and military might. Um, so these things don't seem to have been thought through uh, that clearly. Um, but I think it goes beyond just where this um, object was put um, and goes into thinking about the place in the, in the object itself. Um, so Roger Michel, um, who is often quite bombastic um, in his claims, um, makes a claim here that this is uh, the most exact reproduction of any kind of classical structure ever made. Um, uh, uh, and then he gets into a bit of a spat between, there's another company called Factomate, uh, who do really value um, uh, accuracy. Uh, and Factomate quite easily um, took this apart. Uh, so these are their images. Uh, so this is the real, original Palmyra arch. This is the... Um, uh, the uh, reproduced version, uh, so yeah, you, you can all see <laughs> quite clearly that the accuracy was not one of the strengths uh, of this arch. Um, in fact, Tomato are absolutely right to point this out, but it goes beyond, for me, just a question of accuracy. It's what these details mean, it's why these details are important uh, that actually matters. Um, and it's about being Palmarine. Um, so one of the most striking things about Palmyra is the quality of its carving and the extraordinary exuberance within its carving. So if you take all of that away, you haven't got much left. Uh, and there are all sorts of things um, that are lacking in the reproduced arch. So the reproduced arch just does this central um, <coughs> Uh, arch. It doesn't have uh, the side arches supporting it. And that also sort of makes it feel a little bit flimsy, like it might uh, fall down. Um, so it doesn't look right, but the form of this arch is extremely clever. This is it's probably is my favourite bit of architecture uh, from the Roman world uh, because of what it does in its place. It's very specific to the, the, the place in the city that it sits. Um, so this is um, the main colonnaded street in Palmyra, um, and it wiggles around a bit. It's, it doesn't quite follow a straight line. Um, so I should have brought a pointer. So you have the, um, this is the camp of Diocletian up here, uh, and that massive great big um, complex at the end uh, is the Temple of Bell. And the road is broadly heading towards the Temple of Bell. Uh, and it starts off at first going straight towards it, but then it has to turn because it doesn't want to crash into an older temple. Uh, so there's a little tetrapylon um, to uh, disguise that turn. That's actually heavily reconstructed in itself. Um, so it turns off and it shoots off in a different direction, but now it's going away from the Temple of Bells. So it's got to turn again. So that's the arch um, at the point where the road would turn and head uh, to the Temple of Bell. 
but it's an awkward turn in the road. Um, and uh, the architects and designers of this uh, particular piece of um, architecture wanted to disguise that term, uh, turn. So actually the, uh, the arch itself is wedge shaped um, uh, and comes out like this, so that from whichever direction you approach it, you're always approaching it uh, from a right angle. So it's a very clever little trick to make you um, not realize that you're turning a corner. So if you're only presenting the central arch and you're not showing uh, the whole um, uh, structure, you're losing all of the cleverness of this particular piece of architecture and you're showing that you don't actually understand why it is that this is such a celebrated uh, piece of architecture from Palmyra. Uh, and there are also issues over materials. Um, so uh, the uh, replica arch, uh, which is not 3D printed, um, uh, unlike many of the things that are said about it, uh, it's actually machine cut from a block of Carrara marble from Egypt. Uh, but almost the entire of Palmyra is made from limestone from very close to Palmyra itself. So Palmyra is made of Palmyra. Marble is used very, very um, rarely in Palmyra. So to make something out of marble is to do completely the wrong thing. It's, it's not palmarine. And Palmyra has this beautiful um, colour and rosiness to it that comes from uh, that local limestone, whereas this was a rather unpleasant kind of pukey yellow colour. Um, and even though it was marble, it, there was something about it that looked quite and felt quite plasticky. It just, it wasn't a nice thing. Um, sorry, I really knocked a fan, as you may have told. Um, so, <coughs> is it then actually palmarine? Is there anything of Palmyra in this replica arch? So, if we take a uh, rather um, uh, uh, kind of um, Browning as one of the earliest people writing about the architecture. Um, so it's the carved ornament, which is unmistakably palmarine. Well, it didn't have that, so that's not there. It's the extraordinary wealth of carved detail. We don't have that allied to the virtuosity of the architectural concept, which is also not to there. So there's virtually nothing of Palmyra in this arch. This arch has lost its place. It's had it stripped out of it. Um, and I'm not here, actually, this might sound like I'm advocating for um, uh, absolute and utter accuracy, which is actually not um, my um, position. What I think is cleverer is something like this. So this actually is also going to go into Trafalgar Square fairly soon, I think, uh, and it will go on the fourth plinth, which is the empty plinth in Trafalgar Square. Uh, and this is designed by uh, Michael Rakovitz, who's an Iraqi, um, artist uh, now based in the US um, and this is his version of a Lamassu. So Lamassu are the um, uh, winged human headed bulls and lions that protect uh, the entrances to the neo-Assyrian palaces in northern Iraq and they were also uh, badly damaged uh, by Daesh. Um, so this is his version um, and it's in no way pretending to be the original, whereas the Palmyra arch, the replica arch, is sort of pretending that it's that. It's that. This is, doesn't have any pretensions, really, to claim to be the original. But even better than that, I don't know if you can see that clearly in this um, particular image, uh, but all of the, the um, kind of pieces of it uh, are made from um, uh, reused um, date syrup oil, uh, sorry, date syrup cans. So date syrup is um, one of the biggest um, uh, products uh, of Basra in southern Iraq. Um, uh, and Iraqis uh, are very fond of date syrup, of dibis. Uh, it's very closely associated with the people and the place of Iraq. So here, by doing something completely different, not trying to, to mimic, um, what Michael Rakovitz has managed to do is actually put place um, into this object. And I'm really excited to see what this will look like um, in Trafalgar Square. Um, so what then might happen if we put something like uh, 
the IDA's replica arch back in Palmyra. So this is, uh, this is Palmyra uh, in about 2004. So if we put it back, there we go, that's us building it. Well, it's too small <laughs> for a start. Um, and it's, oops, it's missing all its bits around the side. So again, there are issues over, it would look a bit weird, but it goes beyond uh, just aesthetic questions. Um, and this was also commented on uh, in the postcards. Um, uh, this one in particular uh, makes some really important points about memory. Um, uh, and they say it makes us human, uh, and that if we reconstruct things, we're going against that process. We're stopping history from becoming just that. We're stopping um, the process of moving forwards and moving on. Uh, and they go on to say, it's kind of slightly cut off at the bottom, uh, it's sad it's gone, but it's sadder if we don't let it go. Um, and I think there's something quite, this is one of the most striking postcards for me. Um, and I think there's something quite dangerous about not letting that process go on, uh, about sweeping Daesh under the carpet. They were there. They did destroy parts of Palmyra, and it's a really uncomfortable piece of heritage, uh, but heritage isn't always comfortable um, and uh, we shouldn't pretend uh, that these things <coughs> haven't happened uh, and it's important when we come to um, think about the healing process um, that countries like Syria and Iraq need to go through uh, to think really carefully um, about what we do. We have a lot of responsibility uh, to get it right, and I use he, here we, uh, both as we as archaeologists, uh, but also I use we as someone who is from Iraq, uh, and um, I feel I need to look after my, my fellow Iraqis. Um, that's a rather dense slide, sorry about that. Um, so I worry that reconstruction could almost be a, a trigger for, for PTSD, so trauma and PTSD come about uh, when a, a past just repeats and you can't move on, it's the, the memory has gone wrong in PTSD. <laughs> so you're forever repeating something um, uh, and you're not able to put it properly back in the past. So if you make something uh, that ostensibly looks like it did look originally and pretends that all of this stuff didn't happen, then that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're making that past repeat and repeat. Um, but equally, you don't necessarily want something that is forever needling at people saying, well, don't forget about what Daesh did, because also you need to forget as well. There needs to be some form of healing. and You don't want to do something uh, that becomes a burden um, uh, for um, Syrians and Iraqis. So one potential way forward might be to, to embrace the, the ghosts of the past. Um, uh, and in this rather long quote, uh, what appeals to me about this is that ghosts give us a way of, of not just obsessively recalling a fixed past, um, uh, that they can also embrace the future as well, so that we're not just trapped uh, between past and present. We can also think about what we might do uh, in the future with it. And I need to think through this uh, idea a little bit further, but I think that there might be something uh, appealing there about how to get out of this uh, uh, potential trap. Um, and what I think the arch is doing is the arch is sort of pretending that it's doing this, um, but actually it seems to be uh, more like some form of kind of larval spectre, um, uh, that it actually, it's pretending everything. So. Um, it doesn't accept its own condition, this actually is an arch, that it is a destroyed arch. It pretends at all costs that it has bodily weight and flesh. It's pretending to be hefty, it's made of marble, even though that's the wrong thing. Um, uh, that it creates nightmares and it pretends to have a future. But it does, what, what is that future of that arch? It's, it's not the, for me it's not the right thing and it has the potential then to, to just torment people and not allow the space uh, for, for reparation and healing. 
And instead, we might do uh, some slightly clever things. So again, going um, to an artist, and I really think that we need some creative practitioners uh, involved in whatever we do in the, front, uh, in the future. Uh, so this is Nadine Hattam, uh, who's a, another Iraqi artist. Uh, and this is one of her photographs. Uh, and this is the um, text that goes with it. This is me, nine years old, uh, and your uncle Nazar. Um, but there's nobody in the photo. So she's, she's actively removed people out of her photograph. So she's really making that absence shout very, very loudly. And it's uncomfortable and it's not easy. And maybe that's a bit too uncomfortable as a, uh, um, as a, a way forward for Palmyra. But I think we might need to think a bit more about what we can do. So, um, so basically what I've tried to say is that the place in the arch is very problematic. Um, contextually, it's conflicted um, in where it was in Trafalgar Square, and it was no less conflicted in all the other places it's been. Um, uh, and part of that is that all place has been stripped out of that object. Um, and that in terms of memory, we need to, we need to think about our future responsibilities um, over trauma, and that maybe the way around that is to embrace some ghosts. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you.